Great. Hello and um, welcome to the second of our uh, seminar of our joint ACH and MMB seminars, um, which are looking at research policy and delivery and bringing them together. Um, so it's really fantastic that we are able to um, uh, share this seminar with ACH. Um, ACH Himalo is an award-winning social enterprise which provides a range of innovative and impactful support and integration services for refugees and also for uh, black and minority ethnic and migrant individuals. It's, it's been going since 2008 and it's um, resettling over two and a half thousand individuals every year by providing secure housing, culturally sensitive support and vocational training, which is the training angle is provided by its training arm, Himalo. So ACH focuses on building individuals' resilience in the labour market, uh, on upskilling and supporting refugees into sustainable, higher level employment to develop people's independence and ease integration into UK life. And there you have the word integration, which is the topic of our seminar today. Um, they currently employ over 80 members of staff and deliver services in the West of England, the West Midlands, and offer advice and assistance across the UK. Uh, so uh, I'm Bridget Anderson, and I'm the Director of Migration and Mobilities Bristol, MMB, which is a specialist research institute at the University of Bristol. Um, we promote new thinking on people and movement, and uh, we are unashamedly an academic grouping, but we are also very cognizant of the importance of the field and in thinking about how our work can also be made relevant to policy and to people's everyday lives. Um, so we have um, over 300 members, mostly in the university, but also beyond, and we organize events. We obviously publish, um, do academic uh, and policy related publications. We're just about to launch a new series of um, recordings called Insights and Sounds. Um, and we also teach and we have a new course which will be coming online, the MMB Online Academy. So check out our website and you can see the kinds of things that we do. Um, so this uh, conversation is going to be about integration and perhaps it's worth flagging that integration is quite a contentious topic in the academic literature. In fact, um, there is a school of thought that says that we should just not use the term at all, we should be done with it altogether. Um, and in a way, that's what makes it uh, perhaps one of the interesting things to talk about in this context, in a context where you know, people on the ground are in fact using and developing the uh, concept of integration. Um, and it's all, but it's also then worth remembering that integration has also been criticized in contexts when it's been applied to other marginalized populations, most obviously in conversations about disability. And I think John Fox will talk about some of this later on. He is uh, leading on a policy on a project on everyday integration, a project that I'm also co-eye on, so he can um, uh, give, give you some background on that. Um, and perhaps reflecting on kind of the previous conversations that we had last uh, a, a month or so ago, and thinking about, well, what can academics bring to the table? I thought it might be helpful to think about um, a, a, an approach which has been developed by Carol Backey, who's a social policy academic, um, and who has devised what, is, what she calls a what is the problem approach. So she's interested in the ways in which policies interact with problems. She doesn't look at migration. She's actually, a lot of her work is on um, teenage mothers in Australia. And she says, you know, it's always interesting to ask why is the problem, what, what is the problem and why is it considered a problem? So why are teenage mothers considered a problem? Who considers them a problem? And uh, I think actually thinking about that in terms of integration could be quite productive. What is the problem that integration is the solution to? 
And sometimes when we apply this method, and I've done it myself with respect to um, trafficking, what we find is that people have very different ideas about what actually the problem that policies are a, a response to is. So, you know, so maybe people will, and, and that actually then has implications for how you assess and evaluate the success of the policy. So we might find that people have very different ideas about what the integration policy is a response to. Um, and then there's some more sort of specific questions in relation to integration. I wonder if you could just go on to the, thank you, the magic, uh, <laughs> the magic slide changer. Um, so there are some very specific, there's some more specific questions in relation to integration that um, some of the presenters uh, have been, you know, thinking that we could think about uh, in the course of the presentation. So this is, you know, that you're going to have your own questions, um, but maybe to, just to kind of help us on our way in terms of the discussion afterwards. So um, uh, is economic opportunity always a driver for integration? Now, this is a question actually that I'm very interested in, the way that work is promoted as always a, uh, is, as key to integration. Um, so what about older people or people with um, disabilities being pressed into employment when it's not appropriate? So that's one kind of question we could think about. Um, another question is um, that we look at how the state at local and national level produces frameworks which can act as barriers to integration. I mean, most obviously, um, uh, some of the immigration restrictions so that actually not everybody is allowed to work, you're not allowed, you're not permitted to work from day one. Um, but also, as we've seen with the hostile environment, there are ways in which it's actively made difficult for certain groups to, um, uh, to uh, um, become uh, engaged either economically, socially and politically, and obviously race and racism is key here. So how can national and local government create positive frameworks for integration? And how should those frameworks be structured? And then another question, how can integration be measured if it, indeed it should be measured at all? Do integration measures help with integration? And what is the role of the third sector in the promotion of integration? So as I say, these are just some questions to get you started. We'll um, return to them at the end of the presentations, but do feel free to um, put your own thoughts and ideas and indeed your own questions into the chat. So before we get started, just to kind of um, uh, tell you what's gonna happen, um, Firstly, um, I hope that everyone can put their videos off um, until you uh, until you until you um, raise a question. Um, so I will invite you to speak if you have a question or a point that you want to make, and then um, if you could put your camera on um, to let you know that we are recording at the moment, but we will only record the presentations. So uh, we will not be recording any of the discussion. Um, and then the format will be as follows. So we'll first, uh, I will introduce John, Professor John Fox from um, University of Bristol, and he will talk for about 20 minutes. Um, as I say, if you can just put your questions in the chat as people are going along and I will collect and collate them. Um, but there might be points of clarification, maybe if somebody hasn't understood anything, then I will put that to John after he's finished. Uh, and then we'll move on to the presentations by ACH. Um, I'll introduce Richard and Sigal. Uh, ditto, points of clarification, and then we'll open up for discussion. Um, so yeah, so please keep the questions coming, keep the ideas coming. We had a really, um, really helpful, very, very rich conversation the last time um, that we held these seminars. So please, uh, let's hope that we'll be able to have something similar this time around. Uh, and we will end up, at, we will end at 3 p.m. on the dot. So um, without more ado, I will hand over to Professor John Fox from University of Bristol. 
So uh, just to give you a bit of background on John, his main areas of research are nationalism, ethnicity, racism, and migration. And he's very interested in um, the ways in which ordinary people reproduce ethnic, national, and racialized forms of belonging in everyday lives. Um, and he recognizes the important role that politics and culture in the economy play in shaping social identities, but he's really particularly interested in the ways that these identities are the practical accomplishments of ordinary people engaging in routine activities. His research to date has examined these questions around questions of nationalism and migration in Hungary, Romania, and the UK. And um, he's also currently engaged in a project on uh, everyday integration, which is focusing on Bristol. So uh, welcome, John. Thanks, Bridget. Um, good, so as, as Bridget suggested, I'm going to uh, talk about the everyday integration project that we're both involved in. It's a, it's a two year research council funded project, which is a collaboration between the University of Bristol, Bristol City Council, and about 30 different community partners from across the city, including ACH. Um, Becky, can you move to the next slide, please? The, um, the project is developing a, uh, sorry, an inclusive bottom up and local approach to integration, which is what I'm going to elaborate today. Next slide, please, Becky. And in the first year of the project, basically, what well, well, first year, we're, we're beyond the first year, we're still not done with this. And the first part of the project, let's say, we'll, we'll be um, uh, doing the research. So collecting data, collecting evidence on how integration works and how it doesn't work. This bit is led by the University of Bristol and our researchers here, but with the involvement and collaboration of our partners. And then for the, for the second part of the project, um, we take that evidence base that we, that we develop in this first part and use that to co-produce with these partners an integration strategy for the city of Bristol. So that's kind of the overall architecture of the project. Um, what I want to do today is give you more of the kind of concepts of the project. So I'm gonna um, fulfill my academic role as Bridget was referring to earlier and kind of stick with these lofty ideas and big concepts of integration and how we're developing our approach, how we've been developing that approach over the past, well, actually past few years, um, the past year or so uh, uh, in, in the context of the project. Um, and at the same time, I'm aware that I'm presenting this to a lot of people who are, uh, most people are probably not academics, which is, which is intentional. So I think the idea here is that, is that we have this dialogue with, you know, I've got the big ideas, you've got the, the practice, the experience, um, and how do those things meet up? Um, uh, how viable is what we're presenting uh, to, um, uh, how does it fit with your experiences of, of dealing with these questions on the ground? And so I think that's a, a, an interesting kind of uh, conversation to have. So that's the design of this. Um, I suppose we could begin by just asking why integration in the first place. I mean, the title of the workshop is Beyond Integration. We should be moving beyond these sorts of ideas. And, and as Bridget alluded to in her introduction, uh, most of us academics who are involved in this project come to integration uh, um, through critiques on integration. So this is not something that we were comfortable with. There are a lot of academic uh, critiques uh, out there. A lot of our partners share skepticism about the concept of integration. The mayor is not too keen on the idea. So there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of concern about this idea, but rather than, I mean, I guess since it's been so exhaustively critiqued, it's, it, we get the sense that, well, we know what the flaws are with integration. We know lots of the flaws are with integration. So rather than just sort of, you know, move beyond it completely, let's pick up on those flaws and try to fix them and see if it can be put to good use. I mean, integration, you know, just in some sort of common sense way, should be a good thing, right? I mean, it's, it's you know, I, I want to be integrated, you want to be integrated, we want, we want other people to be integrated as well. So there's this kind of, you know, positive connotation with integra integration that suggests that we should be interested in this sort of thing. Yet if we look at integration on the ground, how it's, how it's, how it's critiqued in policy circles and also academic discourse as well, um, it seems to often be more of the problem uh, than, than, than the solution. A lot of this has to do, at least in our view, with how the integration problem is defined, something that Bridget, again, was alluding to in her introduction as well. Um, uh, some of the assumptions that are built into prevailing understandings of integration. So Becky, if you can move to the next slide, please. 
I just keep wanting to turn up my mouse here, but I hope I don't do that. I'll probably destroy things. Um, so, so I think if you, you know, obviously there's there's loads of in understandings and interpretations of integration. This, in a nutshell, though, is intended to capture some of the basic prevailing assumptions that inform integration. Those assumptions are that the lack begin with the, this idea that the lack of integration is a problem. So we start with this deficit kind of assumption right from the beginning, and that the problem population that needs to be integrated are immigrants or immigrants and refugees, sometimes ethnic minorities, sometimes cast in that are a little bit wider, more widely. But this there's always a, a, a problem population that's at the center of this. The second assumption is that the state, it's the role of the state to fix these problems, that the state needs to kind of step in and say, all right, we've got an integration problem, let's fix it. And then the third problem is that the integration or the third assumption <laughs> problem too, but the third assumption is that integration occurs into this kind of idea of the nation state. So we become integrated by becoming British or by becoming national or developing a kind of national identity. So that's this, I think the way we think about integration, uh, or I think the way prevailing approaches think about integration raises a number of problems. And, and so we try to, I'll go through those a little bit more systematically in a moment, but, but um, we've tried to move beyond those sorts of problems, not beyond integration uh, per se, but beyond the problems of integration and develop our own approach. Um, so Becky, if you can move to the next slide, which is really just the inverse of that, right? So um, we offer instead that integration is not a problem, nor is it really even a solution. It's just something that we do. It's part of a set of everyday practices and exchanges and activities that really is involving everyone. So it's not just, it's not just about immigrants and, and, and refugees or certain or clearly defined segments of the population. It's something that all of us should be invested in. And so this is meant to be a much more inclusive approach to integration. It's also bottom up and in that integration is not, it doesn't happen by edict, by fiat, by the state saying you need to integrate and do this, don't do that, that kind of thing. The integration is the practical accomplishment of you and I engaging in routine activities in our everyday life. So this again moves away from that deficit logic. We're just doing this. We're already doing it. Demystifies it as well. We're just we're, we're integrating in our everyday practices. And I think we need to begin by recognizing that it's a positive thing. And then the third bit is that the uh, uh, integration happens locally, or at least begins locally. I mean, it's not contained to local in a way that national integration is somehow contained within the nation state or something. But it's it's something that begins locally. If we're talking about a kind of practice base and everyday base, everyday approach to integration, we're talking about things that happen locally. There's a physicality to it. There's a, it's, it starts with where we are in our everyday lives. So what I want to do then in the presentation today is to elaborate this framework for integration that we're developing um, and, and see how we can avoid some of the problems that have uh, existed in the research on, or sorry, in, in integration to integration policy and discourse to date. I'm gonna begin by redefining the integration problem that is going to then in this kind of, you know, reverse engineering, take us to this particular fix, right? So to get to this fix, we need to redefine the problem to begin with. So I'll start with that. And then in the third, the second, third, and fourth bits of the of the presentation, I'll go through, I'll just briefly elaborate this inclusive bottom up and local these dimensions of our approach. So um, yes, thank you, Becky. I anticipated that one. Well done. Uh, the um, the reason prevailing approaches feature the assumptions that I just mentioned that immigrants are the integration problem, that the state is responsible for fixing those problems, and that integration occurs into the nation is that the problem they're fundamentally trying to address, that integration is trying to address, is a problem of difference. And that is that there are two kinds of people. There are the people who are integrated, who basically do not feature in integration discourse or policy. They're just the kind of the invisible other against which, or the invisible standard against others which are unintegrated are considered uh, uh, or are judged as uh, um, uh, in terms of their integration. So there are the integrated and there are the unintegrated, and it's the unintegrated unequivocally who are the problem. Um, and so if the problem that these undegrade, unintegrated people, if, if the problem with these unintegrated people is that they are different in some way, and we can talk about all kinds of difference, but we just keep it very general right now, just talk about difference. 
then the fix to that problem immediately presents itself as to stop being different, become similar in some sense, or make people similar. And we can think about this in the history of assimilation and, and, and integration. I mean, you know, we have coercive means to make people similar, that's assimilation. We have more kind of, you know, kinder, gentler versions like integration, where it's designed to be a kind of meeting in the middle, a kind of, you know, uh, let's, uh, I don't know, two-way street, shake hands in the middle, that kind of thing or something. But these are really the finer points here. Both of these, either way, the fundamental problem here is difference. And the fundamental fix is somehow overcoming that difference, whether it's coerced or whether it happens somehow more organically. The problem, however, with an approach that starts with difference is that it has trouble getting away from difference, right? So that when we, when we begin with this idea of difference, integration approaches are operating with and even reinforcing the difference that they claim that they want to overcome. So it identifies and sometimes stigmatizes some people as different and then asks them not to be different. And then if you think of the particular kind of difference we're talking about when we're talking about integration, the typical binary is a kind of native immigrant binary, right? So I, I have used square, scare quotes for those things, but, but that's kind of the, the logic of integration. We're talking about immigrants, we're talking about natives. So how is it, if, if, if we're supposed to get rid of difference, how is it that an immigrant is supposed to become a native? I mean, a native suggests that you're born in a particular place. An, a, an immigrant can do a lot of things, but she cannot become a native. So we set up this kind of situation or, or integration leads to this kind of situation of almost perpetual becoming, not, never quite getting there completely, never quite becoming integrated because of this fundamental flaw with the idea of difference. It gets reproduced through integration discourse and policy. So for us, the problem with integration isn't that people are different, it's that people, and you can switch to the next slide here, um, Becky, please, is that people are kept apart by all sorts of things that get in the way of their integration. So it's not, the problem isn't with the people, it's a problem, the problem is with other things that are preventing people from just getting on with their routine daily activities, exchanges, mobilities, these sorts of things. So here, <laughs> so we can think about problems in terms of economic problems like precarity, insecurity, unemployment, all these sorts of things. We can think of social problems like fear, mistrust, racism, um, uh, prejudice, uncertainty. We can think of civic problems or legal problems like uh, disenfranchisement or, or legal constraints that prevent people from full participation, things like no recourse to public funds, things like that. And we can also think of spatial problems, right? So, so, so just the kind of transport infrastructure. I mean, if we're gonna meet up with people, then we need to be able to have some kind of mobility to, to allow that uh, meeting up to take place. And sometimes that's not um, uh, up to standard or it can be, uh, a barrier to integration. Um, and then loads more things, right? These are actually the specific concerns of the project, the things that we're focusing on in particular. Um, you have to start somewhere. But if you look at these problems or think about these sorts of things, barriers to people kind of, the things that are keeping people apart, if you look at these things, making people similar isn't going to fix any of these problems. Rather, the fix for these particular set of issues is to address and attenuate these and other barriers that are keeping people apart, not to push people together. And I have to be clear on this. I struggle with this language. This is the first time I've used this keeping apart and coming together. I don't really like it. So if you have a different suggestion, let me know. Because this isn't kind of a meeting and holding hands and singing songs kind of thing. This is, this is just more about removing the barriers that prevent people from doing the things that they would otherwise want to be able to do. And, and so it's about it's about the barriers more than it is about the people kind of meeting up. So then how are we going to come up with an approach that isn't based on difference and can remove the barriers that get in the way of social exchange? Thank you, Becky. Well, first we are going to start by making integration about everyone. So this is the inclusive bit right here. I mean, if the problem with prevailing approaches to integration is that they separate us into categories of integrated and unintegrated, then the fix is obvious. Stop doing that, right? I mean, this is a problem. We can't just we can't just name and shame particular populations and say, okay, you're not integrated, and then keep driving that that position home in a way that in a way that becomes its own barrier to integration. Our approach to integration begins not with groups or individuals, right? So we're trying to move it away from 
people as the bearers, as the, as the kind of bearers of integration, um, and, and, and think about the everyday places, contexts, and settings for routine interaction and exchange. So if we stop thinking about integration as us and them, we're just left with us, right? And that's, that's kind of where we want to be. So we're trying to recalibrate integration uh, into an approach that includes everyone. This is not about becoming similar. We don't start with people who are different, whose job it is to become similar. We start with this idea of exchange, a routine kind of interaction, something that all of us are already doing, something all of us are already are always invested in, right? So that's something that we want to be doing. We're not ask, be asking, we're not being asked to do something different or more. We're being asked to do, we're being asked to be able to do the things that are that provide the key building blocks of integration. So the problem, in other words, is not with integration, is not the problem with integration is not with us, it's with the things getting the way with that getting the way of us meeting up, coming together, having some possibility for exchange. Things like institutions, right? Institutions that channel us in certain directions, but away from other directions, right? They shape our opportunities for, for, for whom we're going to meet up with and, and who we're not going to meet up with. Um, everyday processes and routines I and mean, the habituated routines that, 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 that uh, uh, make up our everyday lives of, you know, work and school and doing the school run and sport and all these sorts of things. Um, uh, so these sorts of things too. Um, local spaces and the, and the different ways in which we experience those spaces, the things that shape our uh, everyday mobilities, right? So how we experience different space and how that contributes to our possibilities for integration. And also time, right? I mean, it seems like an ob uh, maybe not an obvious thing, but, but why should we think of integration as a steady state? I mean, it's something that there are moments of integration and there are moments when we come together, we can think of St. Paul's Carnival, but they're also just kind of micro interactional moments of integration as well. It's not something that's constantly steady. So all of these things affect, evolve, and impact all of us, right? These aren't things that are, that are, I mean, immigrants' experience of these things may be different from yours and mine, but they, but these are things, these are general things that involve all of us. So integration approaches that show that individuals and groups are unintegrated mark those populations as deficient, uh, um, and then assign them responsibility for fixing those problems. And that's kind of a perverse logic, isn't it? That's, that conflates the causes of integration with its effects, and then goes on to blame the people who embody those causes as, uh, or sorry, as the uh, embody those effects as uh, the problem. So if there's an integration problem to fix, it's not the people who are unintegrated that need fixing, but the things that are hindering their integration where the interventions need to be made. Next slide, please, Becky. The second feature of our, approach, of our approach is that we view integration as the ongoing practical accomplishment of people engaging in practices, mobilities, and exchanges in their everyday life. So basically what I've been saying already. So it's not a top-down approach. It's not the state telling us what to do, but a bottom-up one where the labor of integration is already being done by you and me in our everyday lives. And so the first step is to just begin by recognizing this, that this is something that's not a problem, it's something that we are already doing. We're already integrating every day, all the time, right? We're doing this in a kind of positive way and we need to build on those positive examples to, uh, to uh, improve the opportunities for integration. We've got a lot of knowledge and understanding of these practices. Um, uh, we've got a lot of knowledge and understanding of these practices, um, but it's an untapped risk for us. And this is where we think community organizations can play a key role in helping things. Um, government too, local government uh, uh, has an important role in this. A government can learn from these practices um, and it's also in a position to, uh, to address the barriers that adversely affect integration. So interventions that follow from this knowledge are ongoing, piecemeal and specific. It's not necessarily this kind of heralded, you know, integration banner that says we're gonna have a kind of one size fits all approach to things. It's, it's a continual, an ongoing process of, of fine tuning um, and adjusting how integration works in local communities. Just very quickly on the last point, because I'm giving these messages that I, my time is up now. Um, last slide, Becky, and I'll go through it quickly, is the third feature of our approach to integration is that integration is local, worst kept secret in, in uh, integration scholarship and also approaches to integration, or dis, uh, sorry, policy approaches to integration now. This is the general trend. We're, trend. We're kind of 
pushing on an open door right here, but it's still central to what we're doing here. So state level national approaches have been criticized for being out of touch with, with, with what's happening on the ground, sometimes more concerned with questions like fundamental British values than with the lived realities or the lived experience of integration in local communities. So rather than trying uh, to take these national agendas and translate them into the delivery of, of local integration event interventions, our approach is just to flip the whole thing, just to turn it all around uh, and, and, and begin with the local, sharing best practices with other local communities. There isn't, again, uh, the idea of a local approach is that there isn't one single local approach. So every local approach has to be developed uh, uh, locally, but that doesn't mean we can't share across different um, uh, local, uh, uh, different communities, and that's something we should be doing. So we're not saying that integration is only local. This is an integration into the city or into the local community. It's integration that begins at the local level and it provides a gateway for thinking about integration, how it works, how it doesn't work, and also the different levels, whether it's national, super, uh, supranational, transnational, translocal, however you want to think about it. So last, last slide, please, Becky, and then I'm really done. So just, just to recapitulate, inclusive bottom-up and local approach. This is approach, an, an approach not designed to help people become similar, though in some cases that could happen. Rather, it's an approach designed to increase and enhance people's opportunities for meaningful and constructive social exchange, which is where the labor of integration is done. So I'll stop there. Sorry for going over. Thanks very much for your attention and look forward to getting some feedback from you. Great, thanks very much, John. Um, and it uh, doesn't seem that there's any questions or, or um, clarifications in the chat yet, so, uh, so we can move on. But please, if you have any thoughts on what people are saying, can I ask you to um, do put it in the chat as we're going along? Uh, so now I would like to introduce Richard Thickpenny and Sigal Abdi, both from ACH. Um, so Richard's going to talk first, and uh, Richard has been working with refugee communities for nearly 20 years, um, bringing this experience into the design of programs which challenge the status quo. Um, he leads ACH's ambitious research and consultancy plans, which links uh, academics with their um, rethinking refugee ethos and he presents regularly on the topics of refugee self-integration and policy controlled integration providing uh, inspirational and fascinating conversations about how barriers are created by policy and how agency can be enhanced to overcome these barriers and then we'll move straight on to Sigal because their uh, presentations actually um, flow one into the other. Um, so Sigal Abdi is the projects officer at ACH whose works on community empowering, empowerment initiatives in the areas of migration, advocacy, gender empowerment and youth development to that, since 2010 in both the UK and the Horn of Africa. She's expertise in different forms of qualitative research, trainings and community mobilizing in projects that work towards socioeconomic opportunities for marginalized communities. Sigal has led international development campaigns, reaching out to refugees and debunked misinformation by smugglers, particularly related to current mixed migration developments. Her experience in lobbying, creating strategic stakeholder relationships and the ability to reach wide, the wider population in consultation with UN agencies has shaped her work in Coventry. Currently, she showcases ACH's Rethinking Refugees principles in the West Midlands by redefining the narrative around refugees to a more positive message of economic benefit to the UK and a positive contribution to local communities. Sigal's efforts and work exertions in her public and private life is a true story of refugee success and really inspires the local community and everyone she comes across. So we're very lucky to have her and indeed to have Richard. Um, so uh, without more ado, I will hand over to Richard. Uh, thanks there, Bridget. Uh, can we have the next slide, Becky, please? So just as a sort of start point, really, with the work that 
ACH has embarked on into integration. Five or six years ago, um, in response to the re refugee crisis that uh, highlighted the need for you know, all of Europe and, and globally institutions, governments that to prepare themselves for the needs of, of refugees. We needed to look at what we ourselves in ACH were doing. And we realized that actually at the time we had very little um, validity because we had limited evidence of the work that we were doing. So although we were engaged in quite interesting projects, in conversation with policymakers and conversations with academics, it was very much a, a nice conversation. At the same time, we we're also looking at our social impact because there's very much a narrative at the time around evidencing you know, your value for money on the pounds that donors were giving you. And whereas we could evidence that we were making a, a social impact, we came across um, a data figure that really shocked us into thinking quite differently about the way that we worked. And that was that 75% of refugees never progress beyond entry level employment. So where we'd been delivering funded contracts and you know, securing grants to improve employability and get people into jobs, what we were in effect doing was basically perpetuating, perpetuating refugee poverty. We were, our impact was as so many others across the UK, our impact was primarily getting people into entry level jobs and ensuring that we maintained poverty. Um, and that wasn't what we'd set out to do. We'd, we'd aim to set to transform people's lives. So the rethinking refugee process brought us into a new way of, of thinking about that. So it's not, we've deliberately used the singular to allow us to focus on what an individual needs to make the changes in their lives to establish at whatever position they're going to establish. So we've got the grand aims within ourselves. So we know that every year we work with about two and a half thousand people. So over a 10 year period, that's 25,000 people, which if you live in the West country, that's essentially the population of Froome. So it's, it's the small market town that we actually impact on every 10 years. And we needed a, a marker for ourselves on what we were doing. So if we knew that progressing people into entry level jobs had the implication that it could be entrenching poverty, what would be our actual marker? And we looked to the United Nations Charter on that, which says that refugees, refugees should not be disadvantaged in relation to the native population. So the markers in the native population, the UK population, um, we've used median salary, which is approximately 25 to 26k per year. Um, so what we then looked at is how would we develop the work that we we're doing to try and build that into the way that we progressed individuals through not only our accommodation based services but also with our interactions in the community and the training provision that we provided for that community so setting that target that allows us to actually focus on a better future for those that we're working with and we may ultimately never get twenty five thousand people into median salary jobs but it's as a, as a business, as an organisation, it's a lot better to focus on a stretch target than just to go, well, we can get 25,000 people into warehousing jobs with Amazon on zero hours contract, and then that's us achieved that aim of you know, serving the refugee well. What we also wanted to do is to drive a collective impact agenda, because what we're finding is, as Bridget alluded to at the beginning, is, is finding the right solution to the right problem. So 
it's the problem of the refugees or it's the problem of those within the, the sector who are not skilled enough or it's, it's the problem the the policy so looking at identifying what the right solution was to the right problem has been a key piece of our work we also because we know that evidence is this king or always key to actually changing policy we looked at how we would improve that data resource so we we needed a mechanism where we could actually create measures of of impact so th through research on erasmus projects over the last two or three years and partnerships in with university of bristol and, and aston university we've been looking at different ways that we can evidence the work that we're doing um, we've got a large-scale enterprise projects now delivering across the west of england and the west midlands and we're partnering with U the university of, of bristol to look at some of the hypotheses that were built into that enterprise piece so we're looking at the evidence base for behavior changes as a result of a new approach to providing business support into the community and importantly what we need is when you only work with grant funding it's very very difficult to establish evidence bases and programs of change and to look at what's actually happening within the community so what we've aimed to do as much as possible is build ourselves as a sustainable business so that actually we can constantly focus on that social innovation as a sort of testament to that we've just recently won a career tech prize to further develop our artificial intelligence driven career management tool which is designed to build out um, the unconscious bias in the careers and advice service that are provided to refugees but also to provide more widely to community a resource that allows them to work with ref refugees and better develop their career management capabilities um can I have a next slide becky one thing we, we looked at as taking us the approach of, of interpreting the line of agency or the, the line of life agency and position that around integration because in essence this line represents the the area of work that ACH can actually control in terms of of changing and transforming an individuals lives so people come into us from the asylum process uh, so we aid around the transitioning language and culture our support service aims to build in self-integration capability and independence so again it's, well, this is around building that agency the ability to be in control of the choices around where you're going to end or how you're going to integrate what types of jobs you're going to do and we have a, a career development and progression functionality so this line of integration component is extremely difficult to put together in the uk currently because policy actually segments every single component funding segments every single component so to actually put a line of integration together put, to put a program together for an individual you quite regularly putting together 10 to 15 different types of funding stream all with their own reporting to all of their own funders and that to try and actually ensure that an individual has an end-to-end an -end service which with it's not just the individuals working with but with that concept of actually going from a secondary education or primary primary education which individuals may have had in the home country to a position within the UK where you can actually flex between jobs and not just be sort of railroaded towards the warehousing security jobs cleaning jobs it takes time and it takes focus and it takes consistency so 
having to transition between lots of different funding streams is it's quite wearisome for an organization like ourselves but it's also quite detrimental for those we're working with and that's each different pot of money is part of that policy program which says for somebody to be integrated they must do ESOL, for somebody to be integrated they must do employability, for somebody to be integrated you know, they must have an entry level job and listen it's like just piece after piece after piece which John was talking about barriers each each policy piece puts in a, in a barrier so to get a career development progression somebody needs to the individuals have to have a business level of english policy moves towards entry level english the bit between business english and entry level english there's no policy for so there's there's, there's a big gap in individuals ability to then go from basic english through to the development of the english they need to get into a position where they can progress a career. So next. And then this, like, yeah, it's also what on earth is integration? You know, it's like, how do we map that integration journey? Because if somebody, you know, people coming from matriarchal societies, patriarchal, patriarchal societies have just been through civil wars. Things. So that the integration phase of, you know, once upon a time, yeah, they were in a society which had a set of rules, they've gone through the migration process, the asylum process, and they, they're deintegrating from that past. At ACH, we pick them up at the present, which is essentially going to be that point of inflection but then what do we do as an organization what sort of integration where does it go to you know, what's the trajectory who in fact is defining what integration is and i think john's gone through that quite well in, in the way he's explored that and in this um diagram the orange blob at the top represents society because there's a bottom of society there's a top of society there's a middle of society in many ways so if we go for an entry level approach then are we consigning those that we're working with for a future where actually they never go above the bottom end of society is there something that, which we can do that would move them up higher and because it takes it happens over time what is the correct length of time so is this a nine-month process or is this a five-year five-year process who how do we secure the funding if the individuals that we're working with have been through such a traumatic deintegration process that to actually get them through the point of inflection moving towards a, a form of integration it may take five or six years who's going to fund that how do we do that so next becky and then there's what we've been looking at as well is is the types of characteristics so the home office quite helpfully has put together um indices of, of integration which set out the types of, of measures but that can be quite difficult because again now that the top down it allow, it's allowing local authorities and others to aggregate data and say that they're at population levels individuals are integrated because enough ESOL provision has happened or enough employability forces have have happened or there's an, enough people with level two qualifications we're working with individuals all who have their own names they have their part their, their own pasts their own presence their own futures so aggregating those individuals is is difficult to do because what we're having to do with it, each person is pro provide a bespoke service. 
But what we do need to have, if we're building up an evidence base that we can then inform policy with, then we have to have some characteristics and some measures on some characteristics and an ability for ourselves to go, well, we've made an impact because when the individual came to us, they were in this state. We've then done a series of interactions with them, provided various services to them, and now six months later or a year later, they've moved to this other state because if we're unable to show a change, then why would we secure funding? Who would we, you know, how could we argue that the policy as it stands currently isn't good if we can't say whether we've got an alternative that, that makes an improvement? So we needed a method where we could actually, in essence, benchmark society so we knew what, what we were moving towards and also provide measures of what we we're doing ourselves. So can I have the, the next spectrum? And that's where, by actually enabling this measure of characteristics, we could then actually start to look at how deep a deintegration phase an individual had been through, or how how they actually positioned in relation to sort of societal norms that we were also measuring. It also allowed us to see that actually the point of inflection wasn't going to start as soon as we, we met a person, but actually may take a while as we establish a relationship with the individual before we could start working with them. And by looking at how people change, you could also look at what... Oh, blimey, only two minutes left. <laughs> Sorry. Um, what essentially is the reintegration phase. So can I have the, the next slide? I think this is quite key to what we're up to, is that actually the circumstances change with time. So we've got now a tool where we can, or an approach where we can actually see how people alter through time. And what we're sort of working on is rather than there being like a a pure defined point that is called integration, but actually the concept more is the integrativeness, which is the rate of change of the individual in relation to that parent society. So we're, what we're actually looking at is can an in, how does the individual move in relation to the society? And that becomes quite important because if society changes, how do you know what to do? So if we do the next slide, Vix. So what we've found recently is with the pandemic, there's been a significant change. The digitalization of the middle class in the UK has allowed people to work from home, yeah, a life on Zoom as we're doing today. Those that we're working with, however, have got the suffering from data and device poverty. So the work for an organisation like ACH now is, is going to be focused more on actually how do we get knowledge into individuals, how do we increase you know, data availability and device availability because all of those that we're working with have now got to, you know, the society that they, we were aiming them towards has shifted online. So we had to go through a significant digital transformation just to be able to keep people in line with the changes in society. So that provides an overview of the, sort of the, the theoretical part behind our approach with Rethinking Refugee. And I'll pass it over to Sigal, who will show how within ACH we take that right down into the delivery into a community. So over to Sigal. Hi guys. Um, so I'll be touching up uh, a bit on um, how I'm going to be, well, the importance of, importance of bringing uh, lived experience into, into integration practices. So um, 
defining my Somaliness. I'm not even sure if that's even a word, to be honest. But as a young Somali woman, uh, remembering my country uh, is a powerful part of my identity. Um, many reasons obviously influence this. Um, most importantly, the family members we've left behind and sometimes the weather, of course. So um, in order to maintain this identity, I'm constantly encouraged uh, to claim my Somaliness. Um, in fact, um, despite all of this, I mean, I even have like very limited memories of Somalia. So what, what, what am I encouraged to claim? So um, during my integration journey, um, I've had to kind of like position myself in relation to like public narratives of what it means to be Somali. Um, sometimes these are quite contradictory anyway, um, of, uh, contradictory accounts of what I have limited uh, memory of. So, um, and then also some, some, of the, some of those memories are secondhand uh, from parents and the media and stuff. And um, so I'm, I'm constantly in this limbo of being Somali and then British and then fears of uh, rejection. Uh, next slide, Becky, if you don't mind. So uh, Britishness, how important is that these days? Um, does one integrate um, once they've received a British passport or aspire to have one? Um, the UK has given me a safe home, uh, a free education and many opportunities actually. In fact, I speak better English than Somali. So, um, but amongst my own Somali community, there's a general wariness about publicly claiming this British identity and the fears of like being received negatively by the Somali community, um, because it's generally quite a shameful thing in my community to kind of dismiss your Somali heritage and publicly say you're British, uh, because then immediately you're in this whole concept of, oh, you're British, okay, does that mean, and then there's, there's, you get into this whole concept of your religion is different if your identity is different or your nationality is different. So, um, and also, I mean, it could be pretty much the fact that a, a lot of, most, the majority of the Somali community have plans to return and believe they will return. So, that poses a question, honestly. I mean, how does one integrate if there are plans to already deintegrate? So um, my, my journey has been quite interesting, actually, and um, it, this is how it plays a key role in the work I do in Coventry, because um, I've integrated into the UK um, and then deintegrated back into the Horn of Africa. But then when I reached there as a diaspora member, I wasn't integrated because I had the title of being a humanitarian expert or some form of spy that's integrated in the UK. And then I'm now back in Coventry where we first settled in the late 90s and I'm replaying my whole integration journey. Um, so this is, um, so I will go into the second slide, Becky, um, where we can talk, I can talk more about the work we do in Coventry. Um, so ACH in Coventry, uh, Coventry is a young, diverse, city. Um, actually, it's becoming younger in recent years. Um, much of the city was destroyed during the Coventry Blitz. Um, it was said to be one of the worst raids of the Second World War. Um, and this has actually changed the face of the city. Um, some of its impacts are actually felt today. But um, as, a, as a positive legacy, um, Coventry um, claims famously um, and responds with great dialogue as they're now the city of peace and reconciliation, as well as a city of culture in 2021. Um, and I'm very excited to be part of that journey. Um, so what we've achieved um, in Coventry, the Ignite Integration Program is a project that we uh, did with the council um, and other partners in the local area, which um, offered a new approach to citywide integration. Um, ACH, um, as you know, has a collective um, wealth of expertise, people like myself with lived experience and knowledge on integration in practice. So we realized that we needed, um, there was a need for a more tailored evidential approach that measures uh, a person's skills and needs to offer them advice, support plans. Um, so this is where we, um, together in COVID, came together and actually developed effective mechanisms um, for delivering programs digitally 
um, as well as with an individually tailored approach, uh, which is one of our bespoke toolkits that I'll be speaking a bit later about. Um, so with this uh, particular project, it provided wider benefits to the community. So, um, and vice versa in a more enhanced um, economic growth for Coventry because it increased uh, social capital for refugees and migrants um, who generally felt isolated as well as um, strengthened relationships between uh, newly arrived and host communities. So in essence, the program um, itself actually enhanced and improved community cohesion. And the project has been that successful um, thanks to our local partners and the uh, city council here, who's very progressive in uh, resettlement. Um, it's been impactful, successful, and it's actually led to a new project that I'm now working on called My Coventry, which will um, help and improve language skills and enable new communi communities to learn to be part of a new life in the city, as well as boost employment opportunities. So our very own bespoke toolkit um, is tailored, um, actually played a key role in this. Um, the toolkit takes a, a very holistic approach to integration, and it aims to support the journey of refugee and migrants. This is the data part, so it does get a bit boring here. Um, levels of integration through this toolkit um, are measured through specific questions. So they range from competency, uh, skills, education, and experience uh, with a, fo a focus of self-reflection. So depending on the toolkit's outcome, um, each client or each person is then generated a personal integration plan, which will then support and overcome their barriers, as I said earlier, to social or economic integration. And once an, once an assessment on this toolkit is completed, a specialized integration support um, is created, which is reflective of the client needs. Um, and then later on, we signpost a particular client onto activities, which are specialized and created by ACH. All of these um, encouraging um, independence, confidence, and language skills, as well as sustainable employment amongst all our um, clients or communities we work with. So the main role of this toolkit is to identify uh, where best the individual um, is to actually ensure the highest level of progress possible. And this is done across seven measures uh, shown in that graph. Um, I think everyone can see the graph. So it varies from language, IT. Um, yeah, next slide, Becky. So um, the toolkit um, establishes a baseline of the client's integration level. What this, mean, what this may mean for their needs and approaches um, means that it's the, the main goal is for, for that to increase. So um, once this baseline view of the integration level is done, um, it enables, again, the integration to increase. So if, if for example, um, a client, um, some individuals present a low emotional health, this can uh, then indicate a much higher and a different level of tailored support other than others um, in other areas, which may be uh, which in other areas of their scores that may be high. So usually the toolkit um, we can see a much more thorough view of an individual and can understand better how to assist them on their integration journey um, via their PIPs. Um, so, yep, that's the that graph next. So I'll just conclude, um, moved on from that data side now. Um, I'd like to just conclude on this final point of valuing lived experience leadership. All transformative social movements are led by people, um, especially those most affected by the issue. So lived experience leadership is not just about representation, it's about building something that can really change things. So we must constantly ask, 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 ourselves, ask ourselves where the lived experience leaders are in our sector and movement, and what barriers are preventing them reaching leadership positions. So living through war, uh, persecution, uh, exile, and the asylum system gives people an insight and knowledge that cannot otherwise be learned. So a role to play in society in, is actually in 
creating change through alliances and partnerships, which I think um, ACH as an organization has actually adopted that very well. But as a sector and a, and a, and a movement, for example, we must um, recognize the value of this expertise and not view it as secondary. Um, at the same time, we have to be aware of, I'd like to just say honestly, just holding lived experience above all else and should not assume that just because someone is from a refugee background that they are that they are the right person for the given role. So um, giving someone an opportunity to lead, for example, um, to hold power and uh, make decisions is different to giving them a platform to share their story. So a leader's, um, someone's firsthand knowledge of displacement will inform their work. Uh, but this doesn't mean it, they need to talk about it or use the refugee label in every context. So um, providing employment opportunities and uh, securing individuals' employment can allow someone to pay their taxes and no longer rely on the wel welfare system. But just you understanding that we have a skills gap in the UK and businesses specifically in this pandemic struggling to fill vacancies and then there's Brexit, uh, um, it's, we just need to start taking into consideration we have amazing skilled workers um, coming from the UK, some of them highly qualified, actively looking for work. Um, so the investment is just more than worthwhile. Um, it honestly just makes sense. Uh, and I'll just like to conclude uh, that we need to value uh, lived experience leadership in order to move forward and understand the sector's role in that um, to influence policy in the future.